Chapter Fifteen and Sixteen of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen eighty-seven, by Edward Bellamy. Chapter Fifteen. When, in the course of our tour of inspection, we came to the library, we succumbed to the temptation of the luxurious leather chairs with which it was furnished, and sat down in one of the book-lined alcoves to rest and chat a while. Footnote. I cannot sufficiently celebrate the glorious liberty that reigns in the public libraries of the twentieth century, as compared with the intolerable management of those of the nineteenth century, in which the books were jealously railed away from the people, and obtainable only at an expenditure of time and red tape calculated to discourage any ordinary taste for literature. And footnote. Edith tells me that you have been in the library all the morning, said Mrs. Leith. Do you know, it seems to me, Mr. West, that you are the most enviable of mortals. I should like to know just why, I replied. Because the books of the last hundred years will be new to you, she answered. You will have so much of the most absorbing literature to read as to leave you scarcely time for meals in these five years to come. Ah, what would I give if I had not already read Berrien's novels? Or Nesmith's, Mamma, added Edith. Yes, or Oates poems or past and present, or in the beginning, or, oh, I could name a dozen books, each worth a year of one's life, declared Mrs. Leet, enthusiastically. I judge, then, that there has been some notable literature produced in this century. Yes, said Dr. Leet, it has been an era of unexampled intellectual splendor. Probably humanity never before passed through a moral and material evolution at once so vast in its scope and brief in its time of accomplishment, as that from the old order to the new in the early part of this century. When men came to realize the greatness of the felicity which had befallen them, and that the change through which they had passed was not merely an improvement in details of their condition, but the rise of the race to a new plane of existence with an illimitable vista of progress, their minds were affected in all their faculties with a stimulus of which the outburst of the medieval renaissance offers a suggestion but faint indeed. There ensued an era of mechanical invention, scientific discovery, art, musical and literary productiveness, to which no previous age of the world offers anything comparable. "'By the way,' said I, "'talking of literature, how are books published now? Is that also done by the nation?' "'Certainly. But how do you manage it?' Does the government publish everything that has brought it, as a matter of course, at the public expense? Or does it exercise a censorship, and print only what it approves? Neither way. The printing department has no censorial powers. It is bound to print all that is offered it, but prints it only on condition that the author defrays the first cost out of his credit. He must pay for the privilege of the public ear, and if he has any message worth hearing, we consider that we will be glad to do it. Of course, if incomes were unequal, as in the old times, this rule would enable only the rich to be authors, but the resources of citizens being equal, it merely measures the strength of the author's motive. The cost of an edition of an average book can be saved out of a year's credit by the practice of economy and some sacrifices. The book, on being published, is placed on sale by the nation. The author receiving a royalty on the sales, as with us, I suppose, I suggested. Not as with you, certainly, replied Dr. Leed, but nevertheless in one way. The price of every book is made up of the cost of its publication with a royalty for the author. The author fixes this royalty at any figure he pleases. Of course, if he puts it unreasonably high, it is his own loss, for the book will not sell. The amount of this royalty is set to his credit, and he is discharged from other service to the nation for so long a period as this credit at the rate of allowance for the support of citizens shall suffice to support him. If his book be moderately successful, he has thus a furlough for several months, a year, two or three years, and if he in the meantime produces other successful work, the remission of service is extended so far as the sale of that may justify. An author of much acceptance, succeeds in supporting himself by his pen during the entire period of service, and the degree of any writer's literary ability, as determined by the popular voice, is thus the measure of the opportunity given him to devote his time to literature. 
In this respect, the outcome of our system is not very dissimilar to that of yours, but there are two notable differences. In the first place, the universally high level of education nowadays gives the popular verdict a conclusiveness on the real merit of literary work which in your day it was as far as possible from having. In the second place, there is no such thing now as favoritism of any sort to interfere with the recognition of true merit. Every author has precisely the same facilities for bringing his work before the popular tribunal. To judge from the complaints of the writers of your day, this absolute equality of opportunity would have been greatly prized. In the recognition of merit in other fields of original genius, such as music, art, invention, design, I said, I suppose you follow a similar principle. Yes, he replied, although the details differ. In art, for example, as in literature, the people are the sole judges. They vote upon the acceptance of statues and paintings for the public buildings, and their favorable verdict carries with it the artist's remission from other tasks to devote himself to his vocation. On copies of his work disposed of, he also derives the same advantage as the author on sales of his books. In all these lines of original genius, the plan pursued is the same, to offer a free field to aspirants, and as soon as exceptional talent is recognized, to release it from all trammels and let it have free course. The remission of other service in these cases is not intended as a gift or reward, but as the means of obtaining more and higher service. Of course, there are various literary, art, and scientific institutes to which membership comes to the famous and is greatly prized. The highest of all honors in the nation, higher than the presidency, which calls merely for good sense and devotion to duty, is the red ribbon awarded by the vote of the people to the great authors, artists, engineers, physicians, and inventors of the generation. Not over a certain number wear it at any one time, though every bright young fellow in the country loses innumerable nights' sleep dreaming of it. I even did myself. "'Just as if Mamma and I would have thought any more of you with it,' exclaimed Edith. "'Not that it isn't, of course, a very fine thing to have.' "'You had no choice, my dear, but to take your father as you found him and make the best of him,' Dr. Leet replied. "'But as for your mother, there, she would never have had me if I had not assured her that I was bound to get the red ribbon, or at least the blue.' On this extravagance Mrs. Leeds' only comment was a smile. "'How about periodicals and newspapers?' I said. "'I won't deny that your book-publishing system is a considerable improvement on ours, both as to its tendency to encourage a real literary vocation, and quite as important to discourage mere scribblers. But I don't see how it can be made to apply to magazines and newspapers. It is very well to make a man pay for publishing a book.' because the expense will be only occasional. But no man could afford the expense of publishing a newspaper every day in the year. It took the deep pockets of our private capitalists to do that, and often exhausted even them before the returns came in. If you have newspapers at all, they must, I fancy, be published by the government at the public expense, with government editors reflecting government opinions. Now, if your system is so perfect that there is never anything to criticize in the conduct of affairs, this arrangement may answer. Otherwise, I should think the lack of an independent unofficial medium for the expression of public opinion would have most unfortunate results. Confess, Dr. Leet, that a free newspaper press, with all that it implies, was a redeeming incident of the old system when capital was in private hands, and that you have to set off the loss of that against your gains in other respects." "'I'm afraid I can't give you even that consolation,' replied Dr. Leed, laughing. "'In the first place, Mr. West, the newspaper press is by no means the only, or, as we look at it, the best vehicle for serious criticism of public affairs. To us, the judgments of your newspapers on such themes seem generally to have been crude and flippant, as well as deeply tinctured with prejudice and bitterness. In so far as they may be taken as expressing public opinion, they give an unfavorable impression of the popular intelligence, while so far as they may have formed public opinion, the nation was not to be felicitated. Nowadays, when a citizen desires to make a serious impression upon the public mind as to any aspect of public affairs, he comes out with a book or pamphlet, 
published as other books are. But this is not because we lack newspapers and magazines, or that they lack the most absolute freedom. The newspaper press is organized so as to be a more perfect expression of public opinion than it possibly could be in your day, when private capital controlled and managed it primarily as a money-making business, and secondarily only as a mouthpiece for the people. But, said I, if the government prints the papers at the public expense, how can it fail to control their policy? Who appoints the editors, if not the government? The government does not pay the expense of the papers, nor appoint their editors, nor in any way exert the slightest influence on their policy, replied Dr. Leed. The people who take the paper pay the expense of its publication, choose its editor, and remove him when unsatisfactory. You will scarcely say, I think, that such a newspaper press is not a free organ of popular opinion. Decidedly I shall not, I replied. But how is it practicable? Nothing could be simpler. Supposing some of my neighbors, or myself, think we ought to have a newspaper reflecting our opinions, and devoted especially to our locality, trade, or profession, we go about among the people till we get the names of such a number that their annual subscriptions will meet the cost of the paper, which is little or big according to the largeness of its constituency. The amount of the subscriptions marked off the credits of the citizens guarantees the nation against loss in publishing the paper, its business, you understand, being that of a publisher purely, with no option to refuse the duty required. The subscribers to the paper now elect somebody as editor, who, if he accepts the office, is discharged from other service during his incumbency. Instead of paying a salary to him, as in your day, the subscribers pay the nation an indemnity equal to the cost of his support for taking him away from the general service. He manages the paper just as one of your editors did, except that he has no counting room to obey, or interests of private capital as against the public good to defend. At the end of the first year, the subscribers for the next either re-elect the former editor or choose anyone else to his place. An able editor, of course, keeps his place indefinitely. As the subscription list enlarges, the funds of the paper increase, and it is improved by the securing of more and better contributors, just as your papers were. How is the staff of contributors recompensed, since they cannot be paid in money? The editor settles with them the price of their wares. The amount is transferred to their individual credit from the guarantee credit of the paper, and the remission of services granted the contributor for a length of time corresponding to the amount credited him, just as to other authors. As to magazines, the system is the same. Those interested in the prospectus of a new periodical pledge enough subscriptions to run it for a year, select their editor, who recompenses his contributors just as in the other case, the printing bureau furnishing the necessary force and material for publication as a matter of course. When an editor's services are no longer desired, if he cannot earn the right to his time by other literary work, he simply resumes his place in the industrial army. I should add that, though ordinarily the editor is elected only at the end of the year, and as a rule is continued in office for a term of years, in case of any sudden change he should give to the tone of the paper, provision is made for taking the sense of the subscribers as to his removal at any time. However earnestly a man may long for leisure for purposes of study or meditation, I remarked, he cannot get out of the harness, if I understand you rightly, except in these two ways you have mentioned, he must either, by literary, artistic, or inventive productiveness, indemnify the nation for the loss of his services, or must get a sufficient number of other people to contribute to such an indemnity. It is most certain, replied Dr. Leet, that no able-bodied man nowadays can evade his share of work and live on the toil of others, whether he calls himself by the fine name of student or confesses to being simply lazy. At the same time, our system is elastic enough to give free play to every instinct of human nature which does not aim at dominating others or living on the fruit of others' labor. There is not only the remission by indemnification, but the remission by abnegation. Any man in his thirty-third year, his term of service being then half done, can obtain an honorable discharge from the army, provided he accepts for the rest of his life one half the rate of maintenance other citizens receive. It is quite possible to live on this amount, 
though one must forego the luxuries and elegancies of life, with some, perhaps, of its comforts. When the ladies retired that evening, Edith brought me a book, and said, "'If you should be wakeful to-night, Mr. West, you might be interested in looking over this story by Berrian. It is considered his masterpiece, and will at least give you an idea what the stories nowadays are like.' I sat up in my room that night reading Penthesilia, till it grew grey in the east, and did not lay it down till I had finished it, and yet let no admirer of the great romancer of the twentieth century resent my saying that at the first reading what most impressed me was not so much what was in the book as what was left out of it. The story-writers of my day would have deemed the making of bricks without straw a light task compared with the construction of a romance from which should be excluded all effects drawn from the contrasts of wealth and poverty, education and ignorance, coarseness and refinement, high and low, all motives drawn from social pride and ambition, the desire of being richer or the fear of being poorer, together with sordid anxieties of any sort for oneself or others, a romance in which there should indeed be love galore, but love unfretted by artificial barriers created by differences of station or possessions owning no other law but that of the heart. The reading of Penthesilia was of more value than almost any amount of explanation would have been in giving me something like a general impression of the social aspect of the twentieth century. The information Dr. Leet had imparted was indeed extensive as to facts, but they had affected my mind as so many separate impressions, which I had as yet succeeded but imperfectly in making cohere. Berrian put them together for me in a picture." Chapter 16 Next morning I rose somewhat before the breakfast hour. As I descended the stairs, Edith stepped into the hall from the room which had been the scene of the morning interview between us, described some chapters back. Ah! she exclaimed, with a charmingly arch expression. You thought to slip out unbeknown, for another of those solitary morning rambles which have such nice effects on you. But you see, I am up too early for you this time. You are fairly caught— "'You discredit the efficacy of your own cure,' I said, "'by supposing that such a ramble would now be attended with bad consequences.' "'I am very glad to hear that,' she said. "'I was in here, arranging some flowers for the breakfast-table, "'when I heard you come down, "'and fancied I detected something surreptitious in your step on the stairs.' "'You did me injustice,' I replied. "'I had no idea of going out at all.' "'Despite her effort to convey an impression that my interception was purely accidental,' I had at the time a dim suspicion of what I afterwards learned to be the fact, namely that this sweet creature, in pursuance of her self-assumed guardianship over me, had risen for the last two or three mornings at an unheard-of hour to ensure against the possibility of my wandering off alone, in case I should be affected as on the former occasion. Receiving permission to assist her in making up the breakfast bouquet, I followed her into the room from which she had emerged. "'Are you sure?' she asked that you are quite done with those terrible sensations you had that morning. "'I can't say that I do not have times of feeling decidedly queer,' I replied, "'moments when my personal identity seems an open question. It would be too much to expect, after my experience, that I should not have such sensations occasionally. But as for being carried entirely off my feet, as I was on the point of being that morning, I think the danger is past. "'I shall never forget how you looked that morning,' she said. If you had merely saved my life, I continued, I might perhaps find words to express my gratitude. But it was my reason you saved, and there are no words that would not belittle my debt to you. I spoke with emotion, and her eyes grew suddenly moist. It is too much to believe all this, she said, but it is very delightful to hear you say it. What I did was very little. I was very much distressed for you, I know. Father never thinks anything ought to astonish us when it can be explained scientifically, as I suppose this long sleep of yours can be. But even to fancy myself in your place makes my head swim. I know that I could not have borne it at all. That would depend, I replied, on whether an angel came to support you with her sympathy in the crisis of your condition, as one came to me. If my face at all expressed the feelings I had a right to have towards this sweet and lovely young girl— who had played so angelic a role toward me, its expression must have been very worshipful just then. The expression, or the words, or both together, 
caused her now to drop her eyes with a charming blush. "'For the matter of that,' I said, "'if your experience has not been as startling as mine, it must have been rather overwhelming to see a man belonging to a strange century, and apparently a hundred years dead, raised to life.' It seemed indeed strange beyond any describing at first, she said, but when we began to put ourselves in your place and realize how much stranger it must seem to you, I fancy we forgot our own feelings a good deal, at least I know I did. It seemed then not so much astounding as interesting and touching beyond anything ever heard of before. But does it not come over you as astounding to sit at table with me, seeing who I am? You must remember that you do not seem so strange to us as we must to you, she answered. We belong to a future of which you could not form an idea, a generation of which you knew nothing until you saw us. But you belong to a generation of which our forefathers were a part. We know all about it. The names of many of its members are household words with us. We have made a study of your ways of living and thinking. Nothing you say or do surprises us, while we say and do nothing which does not seem strange to you. So you see, Mr. West, that if you feel that you can, in time, get accustomed to us, you must not be surprised that from the first we have scarcely found you strange at all. I had not thought of it in that way, I replied. There is indeed much in what you say. One can look back a thousand years easier than forward fifty. A century is not so very long a retrospect. I might have known your great-grandparents, Possibly I did. Did they live in Boston? I believe so. You are not sure, then? Yes, she replied. Now I think they did. I had a very large circle of acquaintances in the city, I said. It is not unlikely that I knew or knew of some of them. Perhaps I may have known them well. Wouldn't it be interesting if I should chance to be able to tell you all about your great-grandfather, for instance? Very interesting. Do you know your genealogy well enough to tell me who your forebears were in the Boston of my day? Oh, yes. Perhaps, then, you will sometime tell me what some of their names were. She was engrossed in arranging a troublesome spray of green, and did not reply at once. Steps upon the stairway indicated that the other members of the family were descending. Perhaps sometime, she said. After breakfast, Dr. Leed suggested taking me to inspect the central warehouse and observe actually in operation the machinery of distribution which Edith had described to me. As we walked away from the house, I said, It is now several days that I have been living in your household on a most extraordinary footing, or rather, on none at all. I have not spoken of this aspect of my position before, because there were so many other aspects yet more extraordinary. But now that I am beginning a little to feel my feet under me, and to realize that, however I came here, I am here, and must make the best of it. I must speak to you on this point. As for your being a guest in my house, replied Dr. Leed, I pray you not to begin to be uneasy on that point, for I mean to keep you a long time yet. With all your modesty, you can but realize that such a guest as yourself is an acquisition not willingly to be parted with. Thanks, doctor, I said. It would be absurd, certainly, for me to affect any oversensitiveness about accepting the temporary hospitality of one to whom I owe it that I am not still awaiting the end of the world in a living tomb. But if I am to be a permanent citizen of this century, I must have some standing in it. Now, in my time, a person more or less entering the world, however he got in, would not be noticed in the unorganized throng of men, and might make a place for himself anywhere he chose if he were strong enough. But nowadays everybody is a part of a system with a distinct place and function i am outside the system and don't see how i can get in there seems no way to get in except to be born in or to come in as an emigrant from some other system dr leed laughed heartily i admit he said that our system is defective in lacking provision for cases like yours but you see nobody anticipated additions to the world except by the usual process you need, however, have no fear that we shall be unable to provide both a place and occupation for you in due time. You have as yet been brought in contact only with the members of my family, but you must not suppose that I have kept your secret. On the contrary, your case, even before your resuscitation, and vastly more since, has excited the profoundest interest in the nation. 
In view of your precarious nervous condition, it was thought best that I should take exclusive charge of you at first, and that you should, through me and my family, receive some general idea of the sort of world you had come back to, before you began to make the acquaintance generally of its inhabitants. As to finding a function for you in society, there was no hesitation as to what that would be. Few of us have it in our power to confer so great a service on the nation as you will be able to when you leave my roof, which, however, you must not think of doing for a good time yet. "'What can I possibly do?' I asked. "'Perhaps you imagine I have some trade, or art, or special skill. I assure you I have none whatever. I never earned a dollar in my life, or did an hour's work. I am strong, and might be a common labourer, but nothing more.' If that were the most efficient service you were able to render the nation, you would find that avocation considered quite as respectable as any other, replied Dr. Leed. But you can do something else better. You are easily the master of all our historians on questions relating to the social condition of the latter part of the nineteenth century, to us one of the most absorbingly interesting periods of history. And whenever in due time you have sufficiently familiarized yourself with our institutions, and are willing to teach us something concerning those of your day, you will find an historical lectureship in one of our colleges awaiting you. Very good, very good indeed, I said, much relieved by so practical a suggestion on a point which had begun to trouble me. If your people are really so much interested in the nineteenth century, there will indeed be an occupation ready-made for me. I don't think there is anything else that I could possibly earn my salt at, but I certainly may claim without conceit to have some special qualifications for such a post as you describe. End of chapter 16